We're in Mark chapter 8 this morning, heading through the gospel of Mark. We're halfway through, uh, just over halfway through, 16 chapters of Mark, and it's going to, our journey through Mark is going to take us right up to Easter Sunday. And so if you are uh, part of text groups, I hope you've been enjoying that, getting a lot out. I know my text group's been sharing a lot of really, really good stuff. We're in Mark 8. Wendy and I, uh, the last year or two, really became big fans, like millions of people around the world, of uh, The Mandalorian, the Star Wars series on Disney+. Plus. And if, if you've never watched it, it's a, it's a fun story. But what's really interesting, you've got The Mandalorian, is this, this race of people, of course, in the Star Wars make-believe universe, and they are a, sort of a warrior class of people that's made up primarily of orphans who are raised in this culture to become uh, part of this creed of people, the Mandalorians. And they have, they have a creed that they live by. And there's only a few of them left. And so when they get together, they live by this creed and they hold each other accountable to this creed. And the way that they will say it is like, this is the way. And they keep repeating that, this is the way. And there's something about that that from the very beginning, Wendy and I started watching it, that just resonated with us. This is the way. Well, I've always said that every good story is a reflection of the great story. Why does that resonate with us? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And in fact, in the book of Acts that we studied a couple years ago, the early Jesus movement they weren't called Christians to begin with. They were called people of the way. So I wanna pick up on that this morning. And I wanna talk about the way of Jesus and unpack that for us a little bit. Let's go to Mark chapter eight. We're gonna begin at verse 31 and 32. So Jesus began to teach them that the son of God must and if you're studying, you got your notes and your pen, circle must. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must, there it is again, circle it, must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. This is what's interesting, and the longer that I've been a follower of Christ, the longer that I have studied the story, the more it becomes clear that, that Jesus' death, his, his arrest, his suffering, his crucifixion, did not happen by mere chance. Jesus made it happen. Jesus is going to push the buttons of the religious leaders, the, the people that he came from, his own faith. He is, going to, he is going to continue to push their buttons by continuing to bring God's truth, God's way, which is so completely opposite of their religion, and that's what we as humans do, we have our religions, that he is going to be seen as a threat to them, a threat to their power, a threat to their wealth, a threat to their authority, a threat to their public standing, to the point that they would break their own laws and commit murder rather than surrender all of that power and wealth and prestige and standing. So Jesus comes and he says this, and he's gonna say it plainly, multiple times as they get closer to the last week, that Passover week in Jerusalem. He's gonna say, this must happen. It's got to. And then notice, pick it back up there on verse 32. Peter took him aside 
and began to rebuke him. And the word there in the Greek is like the most harsh rebuke that you, that you can give. Peter is upset and he rebukes Jesus. No, Jesus, no, you can't do it. This, this is no, why? Jesus says, Jesus turned and looked to his disciples. He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And I wanna go back to our, you know, our paradigm of the levels because that's really what we're talking about here. We live in this broken world where our, our own self, our relationship with the world around us, ourself and God is a broken one. Our community of people, our loved ones is broken because we're broken people and we can only be in community with other broken people. And on level three, the kingdoms of this world are broken kingdoms. And so Christ comes, Jesus comes to bring level four to this broken world and to make a way for us. And Jesus is saying, look, there is only one way for this to work. And that is I must suffer and I must die. Now in Jesus' day, yes, there are prophecies in Isaiah chapters 43 and 44 and 53 that talk about the suffering servant but it's fascinating that the, the Jewish teachers of the law and leaders never once interpreted those passages of prophecy about the Messiah. See, the Messiah was always about someone who's going to come in and act like this level three kingdom. He's gonna come in with power. He's gonna come in with authority. He is going to kill our enemies. He is going to wipe the bad guys out and he is going to lift up God's people to positions of power and authority in this world. That's what the Messiah was supposed to be. That's what everybody believed. That's what Peter believed. So as we go through the story and you see the disciples always arguing about, well, who's gonna be greatest in Jesus' kingdom? Hey, Jesus, can I sit at your right hand when you come into your kingdom? These guys were on the gravy train, man. They were gonna be part of the, the staff of the Messiah. But what does Isaiah also say? My ways are not your ways. <coughs> this is not the way it works. That's the way it works in the kingdoms of this earth. But that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. So Peter, you're looking through the lens of your level three human world. I have come to show you the way of God, the kingdom of God. And it doesn't look like you think it looks. So why must he suffer? Why must he die? Three things that Timothy Keller brings out in his book, Jesus is King. So let's unpack these. Number one, there's a personal necessity. Remember that the great story is a, a grand story of good and evil. And when Adam and Eve in the garden, they were part of the circle of love in the, in the garden. Everything was wonderful. They had this, this connection. They were part, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Adam and Eve, they were living the circle of love. But when they sinned, it broke the chain. When they were expelled from the garden, they were broken and it left a love-shaped hole in their soul that no other human being can fill. As I was reading, reading the chapter this week is talking about true love and I can't help but think of Princess Bride. Love, true love. 
But true love is spending yourself for the happiness of somebody else. And that's what we all need, that's what we all want. We look for our whole lives as somebody that will love us, but not need us. Think about that. Love us, but not need us. I was thinking about my parents. We have that picture, is it my parents up there? Yeah, my parents, Dean and Jean. They're, uh, they're in their mid 80s. Mom has Alzheimer's and uh, her world is getting more and more narrow. Um, my dad has, and my mom also has autoimmune hepatitis. She's had it for decades. She is like, even like seven, eight years ago, her hepatitis doctor said, you are my oldest living patient. You should have been dead by now. And that was like seven years ago. She just keeps going. And every time she, once a year, she goes, she's a hepatitis doctor. And he's just like going, you're a walking miracle. I have no idea why you're alive. And my dad has so many problems. He's got cancer. He's got blood cancer, uh, type of the same that Denny Brand had. And he, he got this massive super bug virus infection. So he had to go off his chemo in order to take the, the super uh, antibiotic drugs. And the doctor said, these drugs may kill you. That's, that's how bad your infection is. So he had to go off chemo to take these super drugs. And then now he's, just every time he goes to a doctor, there's another problem. So now the cancer's coming back. So this week on Wednesday, I gotta go take him back for chemotherapy and I have to go and hang out with mom because she's got Alzheimer's and she might wander away. So this is the life that we're living. But one of the things that we've noticed as we have, the kids, the siblings have been walking with them is that there's such a picture of love and one of the things that we have concluded is that one of the reasons that they are both still alive is because they're living for the other. But even within that, and even as beautiful as it is, I see both in it a generosity and a need. They are both giving they're living to give to the other, but they, in their giving, also need the other. And together, they're just, they're just keeping going. What a beautiful picture. Thank you. You can go back to personal necessity if you want. On the, let's, we're still talking about personal necessity. See, we need love, every one of us. We need love from someone who doesn't need us. At, the, at level one, me, I've got this love-shaped hole in my soul, and I need love. But there's no human being on earth that can fill that completely. There is no love, even Wendy, as much as we love each other, there's always this hint of need in the love. That's just the broken world that we live in. And even when we go to level two and we live in community with a spouse or we live in community with friends or neighbors or people right here in church and our church family, there's a level of brokenness that we all have this need that each other can't fill completely. So there's this personal necessity, this is what I need. And God is love, the circle of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the circle dance, the perichoresis, for eternity, they have been loving one another, present with one another, intertwined with one another, in perfect love without need. And that's the, that's the picture. And Christ says, I want to restore what was lost in the Garden of Eden. I came to redeem and to fill that love-shaped hole so that all of us can go back to the way it was supposed to be in the beginning. It came to redeem us. Will the circle be unbroken? If Phil was here, I'd have him sing it. Will the circle be unbroken? He came to unbreak the broken circle. So we have a personal necessity. It's also a legal necessity, okay? Whenever Whenever somebody sins against another person, there is a debt created. 
simple example that Keller uses is, say you come over to our house and you mistakenly hit the lamp in our living room and it falls on the floor and breaks, okay? Broken lamp, a debt has been created that must be paid. Either you come and say, hey, Tom, Wendy, how much we wanna pay for the lamp, replace the lamp, okay? You can pay for that debt or we can absorb it. No, 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 you know what? It's an old lamp, we got other lamps, no big, no big deal. But in, a, in, in forgiveness, we are absorbing the debt. We are suffering the loss because we paid for that lamp. So whenever something happens, there's a debt that's created. And it goes beyond just economics, it goes even into relationships with one another. About 20 years ago, um, I experienced, there were, th what turns out to be, I found out later, three people, uh, three individuals who launched a smear campaign against me. And uh, basically contacted everybody in my life that is important to me, including coworkers, family, friends, and accused me of something that I didn't do. I'll never forget that morning when the phone started ringing. There was a debt created. What do you do when somebody hurts you at that level and that level of animosity? Well, I can retaliate, but you know, that's the thing about, thing about conflict on human terms. Retaliation and vengeance only begets more retaliation and vengeance. It just keeps escalating. So I could retaliate. I could go into defensive countermeasures, and I thought through... What do I do? Do I go chase down every individual in my life that received this, this communication and defend myself? Say it's not true? Make sure you know that this, isn't, this didn't happen? And I just thought about the enormity of that. And so in the end, I chose to turn the other cheek. I let it go. Forgiveness always includes peace of suffering. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, someone smacks you, boom. But it is a willful decision to say, you know what? I'm not gonna retaliate, and if you wanna hit me here again, go ahead. I'm not gonna defend myself. There's a surrender in which you absorb the debt of the injury. So our sin, follow me here, our sin, and I know in, in this room, <laughs> We got so many stories in this room. And one of the things that I love about the, our auditorium family is that I just love that we're, we're okay with that. <laughs> that we just all understand that we're all in need and that we're all broken people, and I love that. But we also understand that in our brokenness, when, when we make mistakes, big mistakes, small mistakes, there is a debt created with God. Just like Adam and Eve, there's a piece of brokenness. We have sinned against him. And Jesus says, look, either you have to pay the debt or I have to pay the debt. 
That's why he came. The debt has to be paid. And so he came to absorb the debt. And that brings us to the third piece, and that's the cosmic necessity of it. This is the way that God created the universe, the way that God created the tapestry of life. And so in creation and in the story, Hebrews 9, chapter 9, verse 22, says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, the interesting thing, blood in biblical terms, blood always denotes a life given or a life taken. When you talk about blood. So when we, every week, come to the elders and Jesus gave us this picture, here's the blood. Life given, that's what it denotes, a life given. This is my blood poured out for you. This is me absorbing the debt of your sin. And Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, right? It what? You lay down your life for somebody else. That is the greatest, most extreme gift that can be given is that I lay down my life, a life given for someone else. That's love. And God is love. God is the circle of love. So when we get in Mark, we come to, we've got the Jesus coming. What we're really seeing is Jesus, the king of heaven, come to earth to pay the debt without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, to absorb our debt. And in doing so, he is coming into direct conflict with the kingdoms of this world. Don't lose sight of the fact that the world doesn't operate the way the kingdom of God operates. Last Good Friday, if you've never seen it, I really encourage you to do. Uh, last Good Friday, we talked about the fact that, that there was an unholy trinity of world kingdoms that put Jesus to death, that executed Jesus. One is the kingdom of human government represented by the Roman Empire. One is the kingdom of commerce, money, power, wealth. That was represented by the Herodians, the Herod, uh, cartel, and then the kingdom of religion that was represented by the temple power brokers. It was government, business, religion that killed Jesus. The kingdoms of this world who are controlled by the prince of this world who was there in the garden and created the brokenness to begin with by tempting Adam and Eve against Christ. See, so we have to come back and say, on a cosmic scale, this is a grand story that is being, being told. So as we come into Lent and Ash Wednesday, as we come in to celebrate this annual remembering of the story, Understand that Jesus' death was the ultimate demonstration of the kingdom of God contrasted to the kingdoms of this world. Winning through losing. Life through death. Receiving through giving. This is the way. This is the way. The way of Jesus is the way of surrender. And that surrender looks like a lot <laughs> throughout life. It's gonna take many, many forms. 
So Jesus goes on. Let's go back to Mark 8, verse 34. Jesus calls the crowd to him along the disciples and says to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny. Deny means I am going to consciously give up my rights, my desires, all that I can claim. I'm going to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. If you want to follow me, then you have to follow me to the cross. <laughs> you have to surrender yourself the way that I did. Winning through losing, life through death, receiving through giving. This is the way. And it's such a contrast to what the world tells us because the world tells us if you get these things, acquire these things, right? And you achieve this position, then you will know that you have value in this world. Right now I see it most on, on social media and online. If you get so many followers, if you get so many likes, then you'll know that you are an influencer. Isn't that a fascinating? Influencer. And when you are an influencer, you have power in this world. And that's the way the world works. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You have to die. You have to give up. You have to lose if you want to win. And religion, man-made religion, is just another form of performance-based identity, isn't it? A lot of us grew up in that, right? You go through the motions. That's what the, 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 church, the uh, temple leaders were. I, my identity is wrapped up in what I do to prove that I am God's person. But that's just, it's another form of achieving lots of likes and becoming an influencer. Only it's got a religious wrapped around it. So what Jesus calls us to do is surrender. So this is where we come down to where the rubber meets the road. Last week in the sanctuary, I talked about um, the experience of Jesus. Um, Kevin's been talking through this Mark series. It's not, about, it's not about just knowing this. It's not about just saying yes to a doctoral statement. We need to experience Jesus. We need to follow the way of Christ. And it begins with surrender. If Jesus is really a king, you don't negotiate with the king. You don't. You don't go to the king and say, well, here's what I'll do for you. If I can do this. When you go before the king, you get down on your knees and you lay down your sword and you say, command me. So when I had my Jesus experience. I talked about that last week. I'll never forget. I was singing the old, the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. It goes through my head all the time. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. Even if no one goes with me, I'm still gonna follow. No turning back. And it was in that moment that it wasn't just like, yeah, I think I believe. It was, no, God, Jesus, here's my life. I surrender it to you. 
I claim no rights. Where you send me, I will follow. I will do what you call me to do. I will follow you the rest of my life, no turning back. And in that surrender, it launched something inside of me. There was the Holy Spirit just breathed into me. It was like, whoa, it changed my life. It changed my family. It changed the whole experience. But that's not the only surrender. Because when somebody ran a smear campaign against me and I found out that I have people that, I, that for 20 years have never spoken to me since that email went out, I had to surrender. I had to surrender. Okay, God, I'm not gonna retaliate. I am not gonna chase after people. I'm just gonna be who you call me to be. I'm gonna surrender my desire for vengeance, my desire to make this right. When Wendy and I were struggling to have a baby and it didn't happen, we had to surrender. See, surrender keeps happening all the way through. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come on up. S surrender, this is the way. So I wanna ask you one question this morning as we go into our ending worship time. Are you living life on your agenda? When you think about your life trajectory, where you're going, what you're doing, is it your agenda and you come on Sunday morning to negotiate your agenda with God? Or have I come to surrender everything and say, Lord Jesus, you can have it all. I surrender to you. This is the way. As we sing this morning, I would just uh, ask that if you've never done that before, that as we worship, that you would just say that prayer from your heart. If you really, if, it, if the Holy Spirit's knocking your door and you need to do that, then pray and say, Jesus, I wanna give you my all. I wanna give you my life. I wanna surrender completely to you because there's this love-shaped hole in my soul that only you can fill. Not on my agenda, but on yours and I wanna follow you. I wanna take up my cross. I wanna learn the way of surrender. I wanna learn what it means to live by dying, to receive by giving, and by winning, by losing. And if there's a place right now in your life, maybe you've, you've done that long ago, but for whatever reason, you this morning have something in your life that you need to surrender and give up, then I would encourage you to, when we have communion to come up and to take the bread and to take the cup and to receive what has been given for you. And in receiving his blood, surrender to him what's holding you back. This is his blood. Let's stand and worship together.